The proof of our ability to use history rather than to be abused by history lies in our own power of insight and in the ability of the individual in a Zen-like way to handle facts factually. Always it is the distortion, always it is the exaggeration that gets us into trouble. It is not the, the actual content of history that destroys us. It is the expansion of this content and its intensification by emotion that leads almost certainly uh, to the perpetuation of decadent and comparatively worthless institutions. So in our daily thinking, we deal with history and memory in the same way. We begin by the very simple effort to understand that today, now, at this moment, each one of us is a unique creature. In this uniqueness, we have never lived before because we have never lived this moment before. We will never live again, because we will never live this moment again. A minute from now, another self will live again a unique experience in another moment. But at any given time, the only fact, the only reality is now. Against this now, we have memory, history, pressure. Now, memory and history are both useful only in terms that they are available in the conduct of now. Now we must make decisions. Now we must come to conclusions. Now we must adjust ourselves. Now we must find security and peace of mind. Therefore, all the ages and all time and all condition, all these move in upon us to provide us either with the material for the successful now or else for the unsuccessful now. To use this information, we must then gain this peculiarly factual ability uh, to estimate historical and moral circumstances without the common exaggerations with which we dilute uh, our findings in these areas. What is history, if we think about it? History is just the record of things done well and things done badly and, to a measure, the causes of both things done well and things done badly. History, therefore, becomes actually the world's most powerful statement of the consequences of action, that every action arises in a cause that every cause unfolds inevitably into an effect. And history is the unfolding of the total cause into the total effect as far as man is concerned. Man's own memories are the history of the unfoldment of his causes and their effects. And history for man in memory points out clearly and definitely the inevitable relationship between previous conduct and present condition. If history had meant this from the beginning, we would have had the most powerful ethical system conceivable, because it would have been an ethics founded in the development and function of universal law. But we did not get this experience. We were never able to realize that the actual story of history is simply the story of cause and effect. That history is the unfolding of ways of action. 
and that in every period of history innumerable ways of action have unfolded simultaneously. And in every period of human cultural growth, human beings of different temperaments, different attitudes, and different opinions have been living together, growing together, and making difficult each other's existence in this name of individuality. So in when we stop now and say to ourselves, what does the past mean? It means only what our own degree of penetration is able to bestow upon it. If it suddenly becomes to us the perfect proof and evidence of the operation of universal law, then history becomes immediately useful to us. For that which we fully appreciate, grasp, understand, and accept, we inevitably practice. The reason why we preach much and practice little is because we have never had the vital internal experience of recognizing the importance of the values that we preach. If we really experienced them, we would live them. If we only think about them, we only talk about them. Experience in history represents the unfoldment of a certain degree of insight. This insight takes from history all its bitterness, takes from history all its unfairness, takes from history all of the records of wars and plunder with which we have long burdened history, and reduces it to its essential basic content and proves to us that man can only live by dying, can only come finally to the preservation of himself through self-destruction, and that he can only uh, come to peace by the exhaustion of his determination to war. His peace, therefore, comes through the experience within himself of the utter futility of things done previously. History is the record of this futility. History theoretically becomes a scripture because it teaches us that uh, there are things that we can never do successfully and things that will never fail if we do them well. In this way, history cuts through any cycle of time. For true history is not necessarily compatible with the state of man at any given time. Thus, for example, the true history of man is not compatible with his conduct now. History should have taught us much that we have not learned. And had man inwardly vitalized history as an immediate living factor in his own consciousness, we would have outgrown war long ago because we would have discovered long ago what we must still discover, namely that no one can win a war. We say this, but we have not experienced it or we would have peace. Now we say, of course, that some people have experienced this, but that not enough have experienced it. This is true. But with the facilities at our disposal, and we approach the subject correctly, what we call today the nominally educated world would all have experienced it, almost would have. And those today who are learning almost any subject, from the most advanced professions uh, to the most elementary crafts, would have received this insight as a common part of culture. But they haven't received it. They have never been taught that history meant something to them now. They have been taught that history had to do with Washington and Franklin and Lafayette. They have been taught about the Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights. But they have never realized that history is something that teaches them every day something of the mystery of daily living. 
Now, while we had a very poor knowledge of history, many of our mistakes were excusable. When we had a very poor knowledge of space, there was reason why a scientist could be an atheist. But as our knowledge of history unfolds, it is just as stupid for us to deny its lawfulness as it is for the uh, advanced physicist or astronomer projecting his consciousness into the concepts of outer space, just as it would be foolish for him to deny that this magnificent fabric is in some way ensouled by an ample consciousness. So greatness of learning bringeth the mind back again to God, as Lord Bacon said in his essay on atheism. And depth of understanding brings man's knowledge of history back again to the recognition that history is the account of law-keeping and law-breaking, and that in every instance in history the law-breaker has failed, and in every instance in history lawfulness has ultimately won. Now this isn't necessarily true of the efforts of every man, for the reason that many who believed they were lawful were not and many who believe themselves lawless unintentionally contributed to progress. Therefore, man cannot always identify lawfulness in his own terms. He can only begin to estimate the validity of that which succeeds or survives the great test of time. An artist great in his own day, is well rewarded and greatly applauded by his contemporaries. His paintings sell for large sums of money. He is considered to be the most successful and brilliant of men, and in a hundred years he is totally forgotten, and his paintings are worthless. Another artist dies in a garret of malnutrition. He never sells anything during his lifetime. He is ridiculed and scorned. Five hundred years later, he is discovered as one of the great geniuses of all time. The one who succeeded had something within his art that meant that he had to fail. The man who immediately failed had something in his art that could only be discovered after man himself had grown further than that time so that in all things time divides the values of things, conferring its greatest benefits upon those values which are greatest. A man studying these procedures should and co could come almost immediately to the direct experience of that which nature will permit and that which nature will not permit that which nature will applaud, and that which nature will condemn. Also that which nature will build up, and that which nature will tear down. And against these factors there are no recourses, and they are the basis of universal morality. The individual who has the clearness of insight to follow nature in all things, to first of all keep faith with the great motions of life, will then find that these motions of life will sustain him in the various incidents and circumstances through which he passes. The political side of the problem is only valuable to the degree that it again indicates what forms of political uh, structure are most enduring. Now, the experience in all fields held by natural law is that ultimately all forms, all structures, all compounds must be dissolved. Man has never yet produced a structure that will be capable of eternal continuance. Man has never produced within himself a degree of intelligence which is not in need of continuous reform. Man has never known so much that he dared to pause for an instant in his search for greater knowledge. 
A man has not yet so integrated his own nature that he can survive beyond the normal expectancies of physical life. Thus we cannot say that nature has given its perfect accord to anything that we have done. Nature, however, does bestow certain rewards and certain merits. Uh, nature brings harmony and integration to those structures which preserve the purposes which nature intends. Nature also makes things most easy or most clear for those who most completely abide by nature's ways. And out of this comes the still further historical but trans-historical circumstance and fact that man must sometime break the pattern of history and perhaps sink back into the quiet contemplation of nature as the only answer to the complexity of the life which he has developed. We come to the picture of the old Chinese sage sitting in his little cottage by the side of the waterfall, gazing out upon the great expanse of mountains and sky, here in the quietude of an internal existence rich in meaning. The Chinese sage is making peace with history. He is making peace with the mountains and the forces that brought forth the hills. He is making peace with the oceans and the rivers that feed them. He has suddenly discovered that he is living in a very simple world of immediate facts. That these immediate facts call from himself immediate response. And that as he understands and applies these facts, this immediate response is pleasant, is quiet, is peaceful is not burdened by any false reports or by any misunderstanding of anything. There is simply a very quiet, immediate rapport between the heart and mind that are open and the wisdom that dwells among and flows from the eternal hills. So man becomes in this strange, mysterious way unhistorical in the midst of history. He becomes unhistorical because he is free from every false pressure which history, tradition, condition can cause upon his own nature. Yet he is in no way open to license. His freedom is a quiet kind of acceptance of nature. He is free because he obeys, not because he disobeys. And the proof of his freedom is his own peace and not the wild gestures of liberty which he is so inclined to make. Is he is at peace with the law because he is beyond that degree of consciousness in which he will break law. And laws are only terrible for, to those who break them. So this person has an immediate living experience of the living world around him. He has in some mysterious way broken through the sequence patterns of time which exist in order that he may grow up step by step to self-intelligence. And he has suddenly attained this insight. He is intelligent. He is intelligence. He has made himself one uh, through his own consciousness with this unhistorical universe, uh, which is, so to say, the highest form of historical report. Now here we have two factors involved. We have nature, which in itself is not historical, because nature of itself is an eternal process, eternally progressing through space. Man, however, <coughs> at only one stage of his growth can reach up to the point where he can experience the, the unhistorical eternity of nature. When he achieves that, he has Zen. <coughs> when he has that, he has a certain internal illumination. 
At that moment, he transcends history. But this power of the unhistorical in man is the result of history. It is a result of gradually building up through a whole cycle of experiences the understanding that transcends experience itself. So I think we can say definitely that history is the story of man unfolding through nature to conscious identification with the essential essence of nature. All history shows this strange kind of progress. It also shows man's continuing struggle against progress. But most of all, it reveals that even man's mistakes move him relentlessly toward the achievement of his own destiny. So history is the proof of that destiny. It is the evidence beyond doubt that there is an inevitable purpose inevitably moving. And uh, Zen and other systems show to us that this purpose is achieved when man in a strange way devours history with a single bite, in the same way that it is said that John the Apostle ate the book which the angel handed to him. For man devouring history, assimilating history, taking history into himself, as a tremendous force of consciousness suddenly achieves the unhistorical state. He transcends history. He digests it, he assimilates it, he rises above it. And to a measure, each human being has this experience, whether it is the history of his world or the history of his own personal life, and that which went before to make up the experience of the years. The moment of transcendence in history, or in anything else, is the, ma is the moment of the suspension of the dichotomies of polarity. The individual cannot become unhistorical as long as he is held within the bonds of right and wrong, good and evil, life and death, light and darkness, ignorance and wisdom, superstition and insight, hope and despair, faith and fear. These polarities force the individual to remain in that channel of causations by which Buddha uh, shows the symbol in the wheel of the law forever turning. There is no escape from the wheel to the individual for the individual who clings to that wheel through clinging uh, to false definitions of values arising from a misunderstanding of the entire content of history. How man can have gone through as much history as he has and learned as little as he has is always a great mystery. But he has managed to do it because he has armed himself with such tremendously powerful opinions that even facts cannot break through them. But in this uh, problem of these polarities, the individual binds himself to historical sequence. The moment he has an opinion, that opinion has a consequence. And the motion of that opinion into its consequence is history. Yesterday the man had an opinion, it had its consequences. That was past history. The motion of the present attitude into the future, with its consequence, will be future history. And man, therefore, in past, present, and future, is bound to a, in a chain reaction to a series of attitudes which he himself has put in motion. The individual who hated yesterday will be sick today. The individual who in his sickness becomes grumpy and hates somebody else will be sick again tomorrow. And thus it will go on until the individual discovers that there can be no help with hatred. That the individual cannot achieve to any release from sequence 
unless he breaks the pattern which causes sequence. History is karma in the East Indian philosophy. History is effect following cause forever. In the story of man it is the same thing. Man to escape from history must break the sequences of cause and effect. One of the simplest and most powerful of these sequences is simply memory itself. For out of the memories of yesterday we have sickened today, and because the memory will endure, from the memories of today we will sicken tomorrow. As long as these memories, themselves essentially sick, are perpetuated, they will cause sickness. Wherever there is, therefore, any uh, inadequacy, any inconstancy, any conflict in the human personality, memory as history will perpetuate it and thrust it upon us and continue to do so. We will go on, therefore, suffering from one phase of our remembrance to another until we cease the pattern. Now, of course, everyone will say that memory is something you cannot control, that you can't stop thinking about yesterday. In other words, you can't stop the young man of today from reading history either. It is part of his instruction. But it is perfectly possible to put a new dimension into the understanding of history. The individual can simply take the attitude, for instance, that his memory is like a kindly and ancient guardian, that his memory is performing for him the most signal service, that it is wonderful to remember how he has suffered, because this memory makes it possible for him to know why. It is the same with the problem of pain. We none of us like pain. But if we did not have the power to feel pain, we would destroy ourselves early in life, and probably not one in a million would reach maturity. Pain is a warning, which if we observe it, will protect us from a greater evil. Unhappy memories are warnings which if we will remember them properly, become blessings, because they preserve us from greater ills. History is a warning, and all the most unhappy parts of history become magnificently luminous if they impel in us a degree of understanding which causes us not to repeat the mistakes of history. Thus we can live with memory without being unhappy. We can live with it the moment our own consciousness can recognize the friendliness of memory rather than its constant tyranny. We have no trouble remembering the friendliness of memories if they are pleasant. But the problem is to realize that it is the unpleasant memory that is the monument to the unfinished business. And this is what we have to bear in mind. One unhappy memory that helps us to grow is a better memory than fifty pleasant memories that teach us very little. The pleasant memories always inspire us to think how good we are or how much we have already achieved. The unpleasant memory is, first of all, merely something to remind us of the unfairness of life, when actually it is nothing but the record of our own mistake. If, then, we use it properly, we see that memory is the only power that we have that can really teach us, even as history becomes the most magnificent instrument of world progress that we know but only if we use it, and only also if we can move from history as teacher 
to the unhistorical experience of release from the sequences of cause and effect. Buddhism, of course, takes a very negative point on this, probably because it has never been able to conceive of a positive one, namely that the only answer to not getting into trouble is to stop doing the things that cause trouble. Now, we might say we could also start doing the things that do not cause trouble. But as Hamlet says, hey, there's the rub. We are not able to find very much that we can do that does not cause trouble. We say to ourselves, we're not going to be unhappy today, we're going to have a beautiful day, we're all going out and have a wonderful dinner and be happy. So everybody comes home with indigestion. Or the individual eats too much and gets sick. He never seems to be able to do pleasant things that do not have unpleasant consequences. He decides he'll be nice to everybody, so in a few days he's cheated out of everything he owns. <laughs> so the problem of what to do uh, that is just, right, and proper is more complicated than it appears. Perhaps Buddha is right. The simplest thing is to know what not to do. This apparently you can learn. But in order to know what to do, you must assume a greater knowledge of the unknown than most people possess. We have only the experience of our mistakes to guide us in action. All the things that make us comfortable are negative. All the things that make us uncomfortable are dynamic or positive because they have a distinct message. Pleasant things do not seem to tell much of anything except their own pleasantness. But unpleasant things have a large message in most cases. The historical escape, then, in, in the terms of Buddhism, is this ability simply uh, to move out of this historical context of always doing something that causes something else that causes something else. And just be perfectly quiet for a moment and relax with the full concept that if we do this, we are now starting a new kind of causation. If we, ca if we start simply relaxing, about the only harvest can be relaxation. If we start doing nothing, the only harvest can be nothing. There is nothing more. That which we do not do cannot produce consequences. Now what happens in a universe in which there are no consequences? Well, consequences and their causes and their effects and so forth really have nothing to do with the true world. Uh, that the true world is a world that is much bigger than these things. The world that is beyond cause and consequence, as far as man's moral experience is concerned, is the world of the sunset and the flowers and the mountains. Probably if he breaks them all down philosophically, he can find causes and consequences everywhere among them too. But his impact of them upon his own consciousness is that the moment he ceases making mistakes, he is one with that which is right. The moment, therefore, that he ceases to be a slave of the past or ceases causing habits for which he will be a slave in the future, in that absolute moment of the transcendence of cause and effect, he is for the only time in his own experience himself. That is the only moment he has command of his own consciousness. The only time he has command of his own consciousness is when he does not command it. 
He, when the moment he says to his consciousness, I want you to like Smith or I want you to dislike Jones, his experience is gone. But if he does not thus demand of his own inner life that it shall follow his patterns of opinions and purposes and allows it to be itself, it will like that which is likable. It will be for that which is right. It will perceive the truth among those things in which truth can be concealed. It will separate that which is from that which is not of itself, because the confusion only exists due to the activity of man's complicated, complicated psychic organism. The man is free from yesterday and tomorrow only when he is perfectly quiet and living in a consciousness of now that contains within it also the whole area of eternity. History is therefore swallowed up in consciousness. History exists only for man to finally be able to relax totally to history, to recognize that history simply tells him things that he has always needed to know, but he has never really wanted to know. History is only telling him that there is only one way in which he can cause his own total consciousness, and that is by ceasing to cause anything which disrupts it. Man cannot create consciousness. Man is an, a great egotist if he believes that he can educate consciousness. We think of it in a term now, we think that man is spiritually born perhaps as a little uh, psychic infant who must be dabbled with by every psychologist in perdition. But actually, man's consciousness created him, and it is audacity for the individual who does not know what consciousness is to try to tell it what to think. Yet we all do it. We say to consciousness, you must like this because I like it. You must not like this because I think it injured me. It was unkind to me, therefore you must hate it. And we slowly build up their way, in that way our tutoring of our own inner life so that it becomes simply a composite image of our own prejudices. If we stop all this, and if we gradually relax the pressures which cause these things, we then realize the problem of the Buddhistic Nidamas. The reason why we, we think injurious thoughts is because someone we believe has injured us and we remember. We keep on remembering what has been done to us and blissfully forgetting what we have done to others. We have this peculiar kind of remembrance. But if we can transcend all of this even for an instant, we find the unhistorical fact in ourselves, and we find the, in, the unhistorical point in history. We find that all history is simply the story of this unfolding of the unhistorical and its final victory over the conditioned states of human experience. If we attain this, according to the old Eastern concept, man has this flash of cosmic consciousness. And this cosmic consciousness cuts through every division and form of history and circumstance. It doesn't tell us just what the Babylonians were thinking, nor does it enable us to restore the lost civilizations of Gondwana land or something of that nature. But this experience suddenly flashes through with the total integrity of the universal purpose. The moment that purpose is positive, history becomes the servant of it. And as a servant becomes an admirable help. But when this inner consciousness is negative, then history becomes positive and tyrannizes upon human consciousness. The same is true of our own memory. 
Thus, there is great need for a general revival of interest in the recognition of history as a great experience pattern from which an uncertain generation floundering in doubts and vicissitudes could, if it so desires, learn the inevitable outcome of every vice now practiced, the inevitable misery of every policy which has previously been attempted and is now being attempted again. History shows us that the mistake can never win. History shows us that there is no way of pushing a, a vice to the point where it becomes a virtue. History reports to us definitely that war will never lead to peace, that selfishness will never lead to contentment, that greed will never lead to harmony, that hate will never end in love, and that these various negative forces can never produce a world in which man can live safely and serenely. Therefore, that history tells us with the certainty of a revelation from Mount Sinai that the only answer to these types of things is to set causes in motion which will produce the results that we desire, that these causes must be set in motion by quietude, by peace, by honor, by honesty and they can be determined and defined only when the individual permits consciousness itself to move into manifestation and set up its own unhistorical relationship with life. From that time on, history becomes merely the instrument of man's fulfillment instead of, as it is today, a continuous plague upon his life from beginning to end. I think that's about enough for this evening. Now we'll all settle back and be historical.